So that's not repressing the feeling. I'm not pretending, I'm not sitting there going, uh, I'm not angry. No, no, I'm not angry at all, right? And we've all met those people. So no, I, I could be furious, but I don't have to get mad at you. I don't even have to tell you that I'm angry. What I have to do is do and say the things that will change the trajectory of the way that we're moving. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the show today. We drop great content each and every week, and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. Well, I think another big challenge in this, and we can go back to your Allianz example, Obviously, that's a massive turnaround, and there's going to be a lot of issues causing emotional reactions in that leader. And part of being an ally is managing your own emotions and compartmentalizing that. And I think that's really where the rubber meets the road between a critic and an ally. And we've all been there where our emotions are getting the best of us. So what recommendations do you have when you're in those really high pressure situations? I, I mean, even the example with your wife, maybe you had a, a difficult client who wasn't handling the coaching well and who was peppering you with emails and that emotion is now carried over into this conversation with your wife. We could see how that has an impact. So do you have any exercises that our listeners can use to help manage those emotions to more effectively become that ally? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. It's a deep question. And the answer is, you know, there's a whole camp that says repress your feelings. I'm not part of that camp. There's a whole camp that says express everything that you're feeling. I'm not a part of that camp, right? Like, I think both of those are, are, um, are dysfunctional in their own particular ways. So what I, I'm part of the camp that says feel everything. Be willing to feel everything. Recognize that you are bigger than any one emotion. So be willing to feel all of that energy. Become comfortable and experienced feeling lots of this kind of energy and this emotion. And in a way in which it doesn't overwhelm you, right? And then make choices. And then from that place, make choices. I could be furious at you and I could feel all of that fury and then breathe and say, okay, so what's, what's needed now? Like what will be helpful in this situation? Probably screaming at you wouldn't, but what would be helpful? Like what, you know, like what would be appropriate and useful and help us to move towards an outcome that I want? So that's not repressing the feeling. I'm not pretending, I'm not sitting there going, uh, I'm not angry. No, no, I'm not angry at all, right? And we've all met those people. So no, I, I could be furious, but I don't have to get mad at you. I don't even have to tell you that I'm angry. What I have to do is do and say the things that will change the trajectory of the way that we're moving. And by the way, an exercise that could be helpful if it's hard in that moment is go into a room, and we could all do this now that we're you know, at home in Zoom, go into the room and hit on your bed as hard as you can and scream and scream and scream as loud as you can, put your face in a pillow and scream and move some of that energy that is building in your body that's a little hard to contain. It's physical energy in your body. You know, I run a leadership intensive, this leadership program, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. It was literally ranked the number one leadership program in the world by Global Gurus, you know, over Harvard's program and Duke's program. And, and it's all about emotional courage. And so what I, the reason I find that funny is because, you know, H, and I write for HBR and I know, but all these programs are like, we're gonna give you a ton of knowledge that's gonna help you. And I'm, in my leadership program, I'm like, I'm not gonna give you any knowledge. Like, I'm gonna not, I'm gonna share as little, you will hear me lecture as little as possible, but I'm gonna give you a ton of experiences that allow you to feel a ton of stuff that is gonna grow your capacity to feel, which will then grow your capacity to act. And the most effective people in the world have a bias towards action and you're gonna be able to act effectively. So I don't care if you know more when you leave this intensive. I do care that you can do more when you leave the intensive. And that's all about having, so for me, when I, when someone, uh, you know, someone said to me recently, I don't wanna hurt you. And my answer was, hurt me. Like, that's okay, I could be hurt. Like, it's okay for you to hurt me. I don't, I don't need to live a life in which I don't get hurt. I'll be responsible for that. If you're hurting me too much, I might tell you to go away, right? But 
it's okay, we're gonna hurt each other in this world. And so to be able to not let that overwhelm us, but to actually be able to engage in conversation around it feels like it's the most important thing. We drop great content each and every week and we wanna make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're gonna to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. All of that knowledge in the world is not helpful if it doesn't inspire action. And even if we have a desired outcome, we know just because it's an outcome as humans, we're not gonna move towards it unless we see some positive payoff, some carrot that's gonna excite us. So let's talk a bit about the opportunity and how we, in that third step, can elucidate an opportunity that gets the team excited, that gets the person we're working with on board with this change that we both need. It's a great question. And, and you know, once we've done the critic to ally and once we've done what is the outcome, and then we're still faced with a problem, right? The problem still exists. This person who's disruptive in the team is still there. You know, the phone beeping every three minutes is still there. And so, and, and the question isn't, so how do we solve for that? The question, and this was the hardest chapter to write and the longest chapter in the book because it, you know, when Howie and I were working, it was sort of unpacking, trying to unpack what I do. And you know, Howie would say, well, so what's your technique? I'm like, I, I don't, this is just what I do. Like, here's what, give me an example. Here's what it would be. And it was, it was sort of hard. And we came up with, you know, a number of six or seven things that cover 80, 90% of the situations. So one of them is, what is, if someone's behaving badly, one of the questions that we ask is, what is good about their bad behavior. Not good about them. We're not saying, oh, they can't all be bad. You know, like, what is the good stuff? No, what we're saying is, you've got this outcome, right? You want a, you want a, a, a high-performing team. And, and you've got this person who's disruptive and, you know, forcing us to talk about stuff we don't want to talk about. And I understand how that behavior is disruptive. How can that behavior be helpful to you in getting to a high-performing team, right? And that conversation becomes really interesting. And in the end, that conversation is, well, you know, we're a bunch of lambs. Like, we, we're, we care so much about politeness and, and peace and this thing that we're frustrated with that we'll never contradict each other. And so we actually need someone. We need her boldness and she could probably use some of our civility. And if we can combine her boldness with our civility, we will be an unbeatable team. Well, now we're kind of, now we found an opportunity that's kind of exciting. I mean, I don't even know this person, and I'm kind of excited to work on that problem, which says, you know, we could be an unbeatable team if we just, you know, up each of our games, both in civility and boldness. We could be really effective. We have to have that conversation. You know, another common opportunity is oftentimes there's a problem and I'm scared. I'm scared of having a conversation. I'm scared. And always, if there is an opportunity to do something I haven't done before, that's always an opportunity. There's another opportunity. Let's go back to the example of, of, of texting. You know, the, the opportunity is to connect, is to feel, feel connection. Like, I'm sorry, that's the outcome. The outcome we're going for is to feel connection. We both want that. And so there's a way in which perhaps that phone, first of all, putting away the phone is an opportunity to actively show commitment to the connection, right? Actively show commitment to the connection. You go like, yeah, I'm gonna put it away. But there's another thing which actually could end up being kind of a fun, funny thing. And I actually haven't tried this, but maybe we should do this, which is leave the phone there and actually turn it on. And then every time it beeps, let that be a reminder to go, are we really connected? Are we connected? You know, like, are we really, is there something we could say? And, and they're like, it's, it's almost, you know, it almost becomes a joke, but it becomes a joke that actually deepens our connection. Now we've got this like little private joke. Now we're gonna be in a group of people and their phone's gonna ring and we're gonna look at each other, right? And we're gonna use it as an example of connection. So it's about creatively finding where the problem isn't just a problem, but it's also an opportunity.